Welcome to the Dork Forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the Dork Forest and dork down for a while. Hello, you are listening to the Dork Forest with Jackie Cation. I, coincidentally enough, am Jackie Cation. You know the websites, JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com, if you enjoy a determiner. The Dork Forest is a podcast that's on all the platforms, your iTunes, and then I, I populate it over to YouTube. It's on Stitcher and Pandora and Spotify, and but wherever you listen to podcasts, hopefully uh, it makes it available in a thousand different ways. It is November, and I'll also use this for December. Uh, This month, I ask that you not donate to the Dork Forest. If you want to support the Dork Forest, you can. You can order from Amazon using the tiny link that just takes you to Amazon and you order like normal. You can buy merch on the store page on JackieCation.com. You can go to the Bandcamp DorkForest.com and buy extra episodes and stories and stuff if you like to do that. You can come and see me do stand-up comedy at uh, which my tour is all over JackieCation.com. And in November and December, I'm actually on the road quite a bit, including Minneapolis and Madison, uh, Wisconsin. So those are my... But don't donate. Don't use the PayPal button to donate. And if you're doing it monthly, know that your donation uh, will be going to the LA Food Bank. Because what I ask is that you don't donate to the Dork Forest in November and December, and instead donate to your local food bank. Go to feedingamerica.com if you are in the United States, put in your zip code, and it'll tell you your local food bank. Or you can just Google the words food bank and the name of your town. That happens all over the world. You can do that anywhere in the world. But just uh, for these two months, uh, just uh, help people around you. That's all I'm saying. Other than that... The Dork for- We should do the credits. Yes, Mike Rickberg composed and sang that song with Sarah Cohen, and his wife, and he will sing his version of the Mexican hat dance at the end of the program. Patrick Brady fixes this audio, and Vilmos, still fixing JackieCation.com, bless his heart. Anyway, let's get into the show. Hey, it's Jackie Cation I'm in the living room. I am with Tiffany Stevenson. You are now on the lady comic thread that has hundreds and hundreds of posts every single day. <laughs> Just in case you needed a set, except for that there's very few sets. It's mostly just bitching about uh, stand-up comedy. I enjoy that. We have a couple of WhatsApp groups like that in the UK. Oh, fair enough. There yeah. you go. So at, at Tiff Stevenson, S-O-N, Stevenson yes. with a V, Yeah. it'll be linked in the notes, is your Twitter. And at Tiff Stevenson Comic on Instagram. Yeah, I'm trying to work out Instagram. You know, we're words people. I'm not pictures people. Yeah. The good thing about Instagram is that it is just pictures and you're like, fine. Here you go. This is where I'm at. How about that? And then tiny, tiny videos seem to be yeah. popular. So that's, uh, that'll be something. I like that they're called stories, but you've referred to them as tiny videos. <laughs> they're tiny videos. I don't think that doesn't feel sto- Nobody's doing that prep for it to be a story. I have actually seen some storytelling. Like, I think Jen Kirkman puts a lot more work into it than I do. Right. Possibly a Nikki Glazer will do right. something. Me, tiny stories. So uh, if you want to, uh, tiny videos, if you want to put a story together, please do. Okay. Now, uh, Tiffany Stevenson, you are not originally from this country. You no. are visiting from visiting the UK. From the UK where we have our own disasters happening. Right. You're also on fire. Congratulations. On fire. I mean, you're in a hell mouth oh. like Buffy. Like, uh, <laughs> by the way, we're going to be discussing Buffy. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I feel like what happened was we sort of fucked everything up with Brexit. And then you guys looked at that and went, we can supersize that. We are going to one up that <laughs> and we're just going to light it all on fire. We need we need Canada to do a big gulp <laughs> and take everyone. <laughs> right. Right. They're just like, you know what? There's all of northern Canada is pretty empty. They still only have like 30, 35 million people. So uh, if you're willing to live in the winter, uh, head up. I'm not. That's why I'm leaving the UK. <laughs> exactly. You're like, so you'll be back. You, so you did a show at the Improv and you're going to do again. This will go up the day after. Yes. Uh, November 4th. You're going to do Lyric Hyperion here in Los Angeles. I will be doing that. I'll be doing my hour show, Mother, which is... Um, a bit about me being a stepmother, amongst other things. Okay. And reproductive rights. Um, I do sometimes get a few stepmoms in, ones that aren't in their castles, um, <laughs> talking to their enchanted mirrors. 
So uh, I had yeah. a stepmother. Did you have a stepmother? Uh, I didn't have a stepmother. No, no. You had a did, I, regular bio my, my, mom. My, yeah, my mom. Yeah, bio. Like, see, like it's like washing powder. I hate that. Um, but yeah, yeah. is it too much? <laughs> it's, it's, uh... But you had a stepmom. Did you get on well? Well, uh, we did. She did not want to do it, uh, but she was on board. She's like, we're doing it now, and. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you will be be raised. You will learn how to do chores and your homework. And we, at the end of it, we will love each other, but no one will know why. Yeah. And uh, so it came to pass <laughs> because she was a great loss to the Austrian army because there were six of us. And uh, so she came into the, and there were charts and graphs and French corners on the beds. And uh, she was like, we're doing this now. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to do it either. I never wanted children. So here we go. No, and now I've got six of now you. Now I've got six of you. And uh, one of you, kind of handsome, not that much younger than me. Maybe? No? Okay. Never mind. <laughs> and uh, my brother Terry has always said that she hit on him. Uh. Uh, and I was like, ew. But I can see it. Yeah. She was a sexy lady. Uh, she just passed away about five years ago. So, uh, But she uh, she was great. She, uh, in many ways, saved our lives. It's um it's one of those jobs where the reward is I love my stepson and he's awesome, but you don't get much praise or reward for it otherwise. Like societally, you, you, there's a constant feeling of imposter syndrome. I think with it, <laughs> right? Which, yeah, you're uh, you're definitely uh, you. It's it's screwy. It's not fair because um, it's a thankless job that you are not thanked for. Yeah, and um, <laughs> and if and if you are too into it you're trying to replace somebody's mother. And if you're not into it, you're evil and horrible. Yes. So um, in Nancy Cation's uh, experience, she was like, I don't. I don't want to replace her. But we do have to do this because I can't live in squalor. How about that? <laughs> and uh, and so um, she she got she got <laughs> she got bitched at for all the things, and um, but in the end, very little jail time among the six of us. So yeah. you gotta love that. Yeah, she did yeah. a good job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She raised you right. She did raise us right. It was uh, um, and then. It was very funny because of the things she used to say that she never wanted children. And then uh, when she had grandchildren, she used to talk about how much she loved her grandchildren. Never met them. Very little. Uh, was like not interested at all. Like two of them grew up like 20 minutes from her. Saw them like once a year. Right. And uh, she was like, I didn't want children, but I'm glad that I have this giant extended family that I can tell people uh, over drinks that I uh, helped be part of their lives. So she, I mean... I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a bit of a rip. So I wonder, you know, I I never did get her side of it. Yes, and uh, and so that's what your show is, kind yeah, of her side of it. Yeah, yeah, it's um, you know, I've done like nine hour long shows at the Edinburgh Fringe at this point. So right, and every year something new. Y y pretty much every year, although I had two a two year gap between Bombshell and this one, and Bombshell feels pertinent again because that was all about the left in. Uh, politically eating itself oh like, there you go you know mm -hmm. um and i feel that's still sort of ongoing um i, I even feel like our, we can't coalesce in the uk i just tweeted about this today i was like any chance we can just put our micro differences aside to focus on the big bad yeah again to use another <laughs> right, buffy, right buffy phrase but like we've got we need to get the conservatives out and this sort of infighting between everyone on the left is not going to do it because the right are united in all the stuff that they don't like and disagree right. with and we're fractured and we're also it's, we're it's throwing each no other nuance. under the bus no there's, nuance yeah they, they have no nuance and so they can be all one for you know they can face the same way while they can have racism and homophobia and um and pretend morals yes and the left is like well it's actually much more great katie hill got her revenge porn uh has to re resign and you're like or you could stick it out and be called an asshole but uh and maybe not get reelected, but you know, you. So you had sex with someone at work. I don't think you were the first one. No, and uh, <laughs> definitely, mm, certainly not among the men folk. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, yeah. but let's talk about Buffy the Vampire Slayer because yeah. you're on the Dork Forest. I'm on the Dork Forest, and I yes. want to be dorky about dork right. Things. You want to dork out about about something super fun. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, low gone, like no longer a, a thing. Did you see the movie? Uh, I saw the movie. I saw the movie because it was obviously before the TV series. 
and it was uh, I think it's Kirsty Swanson and Luke Perry. R.I.P. Okay. Luke Perry. Oh. oh, did Luke Perry die? That's right, he did, and he was yeah. only like fifty or something. Yes, younger yeah. every day. Yeah, that, yeah, that age. Um, and it was a cute little. I mean, it was for me at the time when that came out. That would be just my. You know, American culture has had such a huge impact on the UK and especially in your teenage years yeah. of your wishes of living this life where you're like, oh, yeah, they get to go to prom. These weren't things that we had. Ah. I mean, I think the UK sort of has these things now. You but have gardens. Not, we have we gardens. don't have gardens. Right. Okay. Yeah, you have we call yards. them yards. You have yards. But the garden, it sounds like there's more work involved. Yeah. I mean, there's Kent in the UK, which is the Garden of England. But I always say if that garden had like a sofa and a refrigerator, like fly tipped in the front of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, Fair enough. So there's so a garden. Is it's it's all about perspective, I suppose. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> as is prom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because prom can be a horrific experience, as we've for many people and carry. I've seen <laughs> <laughs> Carrie specifically, who I think got her own back, didn't she? Yes, she at did. Prom? Yeah. yeah, I never, I didn't go to prom, as you can well imagine. Uh, this is uh, does not have the social skills to uh, indulge in some sort of. Uh, <laughs> dance so uh i did not i don't know how to roller skate backwards things it, the bucolic american experience but i'll tell you buffy the vampire slayer she had that cheerleader kind of thing well she d tries to join the cheerleaders and then doesn't get in and that's what i like about her she has she's basically a hero but who's tackling all of this teenage girl stuff at the same time right so i think i was probably you know, a bit older than it when it came out, but but about the same sort of age as the cast that are in it. Yep. Um, All right. So it was 1997, I think, it first. Okay. Was it 97? Oh, no, maybe it was 90... God, has it been 25 years or has it been 20 years of Buffy? We should fact check that. I feel like it's 97 uh, when it first came out. I didn't see it when it first came out. I saw it in reruns. Ah, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I. it was... Because, again, it's immediately locking into this part of culture um right um that that you know also you know it had all this stuff about long it was 97 so i was 20 at the time it came out okay and and um but so same sort of age as the cast members but at what it was so rare to see bar sarah connor from you know terminator yep to see and that was a big deal for me because i think i watched that when i was about uh uh, 11 or 12 maybe when that film came out and it was to see a woman just being the badass yep. in the film and totally flipping that flipping the script on the original story which had her as a victim and in this one she's very much right right the first the i like the first terminator movie and i was in my 20s i think but um the second one was definitely much more uh, it just much more powerful because you know I used I spent my entire childhood pretending that Han Solo had a little brother or a little <laughs> sister that I could be right yeah. and uh, so for there to be a woman hero is is always a, a freaking delight yes yeah yeah so seeing that um, she saved the world a lot mm -hmm. um, every time <laughs> um, but but yeah it just. Um, the writing in it, I mean, to kind of write it off as a teen drama, which happened a lot at the time, used to really piss me off because actually the storylines are evergreen. They touch upon all of the big themes that you would get in any good drama. You know, you've got Joyce passing away, this kind of whole episode Who about was Joyce? grief. Joyce was um, was Buffy's mum. Oh. And I always was say... Was that late? Um, like, wasn't she... Like, I think I I saw the first three or four seasons the most... Right, right. So and then she, she went passed, to college. Yeah, she went to college. She passed away while Buffy was in college. Okay. So that was four, I think, series four. Because um, five was the one where... Um, is five the one where Dawn appears? Maybe it's series five, actually. Yeah. Um, How and many the whole years was it? Uh, there was eight, seven, eight, seven seasons. Seven or eight seasons? Yeah, hold on. I'll okay. <laughs> this, exactly. This is not right. very good dorking if I don't know. No, no, it's uh, here's the thing about the Dork Forest. Enthusiasm sometimes replaces information. Yeah. <laughs> certainly from your host. Jackie yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> um, no, there were seven. I'm correct. Okay. okay. Seven. So, um, but um, yeah, I mean, so Buffy's mum, uh, uh, Joyce, who I always joke, like Jordan Peterson looks like someone that Joyce Summers would date. She had like really terrible taste. <laughs> Right, in like was, kind of silver foxes. Right, she it. looked like, yeah, and she looked very 80s for she, uh, for a 90s show. For a 90s show. And she looked, which kind of made sense because she would have been an 80s 
teen, right? Yes. And um, so for her to think that that was still cool made perfect sense. Yes. But she was a giant mess. And um, I think, uh, yeah, because I remember in the, in, the, in the beginning, there was a lot of her not fitting in in the... In the 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 big issues were I mean it was monster of the week for a long time right mm. there were a lot of high school themes in that sort of first series of feeling invisible there was literally an invisible character that wreaks that, revenge that's right who played like the oboe or something and crawled in the in the in the ducks <laughs> yeah. or something yeah um, and then with there were the kind of like frat boy um, oh that frat boy episode. Yes, yeah. There's well, there's well, there's the beer episode. I think that's that's into that's that's into series three. I think that's or four. That's Buffy when she goes to college, um, where they all drink beer and turn stupid, <laughs> which is a little bit on the nose. <laughs> but, but it was. I think it had a lot of on the nose, but I didn't mind it because it was like there was the um, the predatory teacher, yes. who uh, who turned into a praying mantis or something like that, or that was like third episode in or something it was early early days um and there's also um the hush episode which is just um which was in series um hush is the one it feels almost like very gothic one? like tim burton-esque it won emmys and everything else um what was it the was, plot of that one? I vaguely remember the name. It was series four, so it's when Buffy's at college, and it's about these men called the Gentlemen. Yeah, and they go around stealing hearts. Oh, you know, here's the thing: you loved those college years. Yes, that's hilarious. Where she had the boyfriend who was in the army, or oh, something? but he's a terrible character as well. So there is that. Um. <laughs> well, he was all right for like I think the first Riley. half of season, Riley. Yes, but and he didn't like that she was stronger than him. He was a man that was struggling yes. with the fact that there was a woman who was more powerful than him mm -hmm. and more um, morally kind of like able able to see the nuance. Right. He was an army guy. He was very much black and white, good and evil. This is bad. And she's right. like, actually. Now we're in season four of Buffy. Right. It's, and Spike is involved. And yes. There's more real, moral relativity and Spike's not getting killed straight away. You know, right. they want him, they want him dead, but the gentlemen steal the voices oh, first that's right. so you can't hear them scream when they take the hearts. So there's, um. it's, it's an episode without, uh, it won like kind of best script and they were okay. like, oh, the irony of this being there's hardly any dialogue in it. Right. <laughs> you know, right. So, um, so the idea is, is that they wake up one morning, they can't speak. Yeah. And they're kind of like draw it. It kind of is slapsticky. It's very funny. Yeah. Um, but the gentlemen are super, super creepy. They hover off the ground. Yeah. They, they're, they're, they're all in suits or something and they're just sort of floating along, right? They're floating along. And it was very reminiscent of, there was a film with Rufus Sewell where they turn back the clocks in the night. I don't know if you remember this film. No. Rufus Sewell and Richard O'Brien were in this film where, at night, um, they would go out and turn back the clocks and change everything round. Dark City. Dog, Dark, Dark City? City? Yeah. And when was that? When did that come out? That came out in 1998. I think it was heavily influenced by... By Buffy? Uh, no, or no. Buffy, Buffy was, was heavily in, influenced, influenced by, by that Dark movie. City. Yeah, because it's all these creepy bald men <laughs> just floating around <laughs> doing stuff. Um, and horrible teeth as well. That's the other thing I remember... Like, like, kind of like almost pearlescent, glistening teeth. Wow. Um, you know, and that's, you know, there's all these underlying themes within that as well as of, of like having your voice and, and, and being able to speak up. And again, it's Buffy who Riley finds it difficult to deal with the fact that Buffy's the one. She's like, Buffy's bluntness in like, how do I stab it? How do I kill it? And, right. You know, they're going, no, we need to come at this because she can be a blunt instrument as well. Yes. You know. Um, right. Because well, there's Angel initially. Angel's the first, uh, the first boyfriend who then becomes the big bad when they have sex and it turns him evil. Right, right, because he wasn't supposed to, and uh, he should have used a condom. Yeah, uh, probably would have uh, used a condom. <laughs> probably would have left helped. that vampire jizz in, in <laughs> that's a condom because that, that's that's where it all went wrong. <laughs> and, Is it uh, dust? Is it dust? Is that how it works? Uh, it might have been. It might have been like a, a placenta where he should have then eaten it. Ah, uh, I got gross. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> so he was the first boyfriend and they have sex and he turns into a ship which I think is a story many women understand <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that's one of the beautiful things actually it was totally relatable about how she's got all these vulnerable feelings of like I've had sex with my boyfriend and now he 
he's being horrific to me. <laughs> like, right, right. We're, I mean, he, uh, he, there's that weird thing in the beginning where he doesn't want to go out with her. He's thousands of years old. She's 14. Yeah. I mean, there's all these. Same old Hollywood story. Same old Hollywood story. <laughs> it's just like, and then he gets talked into it. This is the romance novel the guy's always been looking for. Yeah. And um, so, but the, the, when they end up, you know, it's that unrequited love kind of thing that then when it is resolved, I think Joss Whedon was like, this ruined moonlighting. We're going <laughs> to we're gonna just embrace the fact that it's going to ruin it. Yes. And then the only way that he could get better, didn't he have to go off and start his own TV show? Yeah, that's how, that's how men get better. They get <laughs> given more career opportunities. <laughs> men behave badly and are given extra chances. Extra things <laughs> for him to do, but in another town. Yes. He couldn't stay in Sunnyvale. Uh, uh, he had to go... Um, because um, Sunnyvale, California, Sunnydale, Sunnydale. Sunnydale, but Sunnyvale, yeah. California, yeah, is a real place. Oh, right, right. And so, um, and the recurring joke has, ever since the '90s has been that it is a hellmouth, <laughs> and uh, now it is an IT hellmouth because it's all um, Google and tech and, and tech and stuff. So, because it's in Silicon Valley, but um, so yeah, so he so goes he, away. He goes away to start his own his own series, which is Angel, eponymous, eponymous show, Angel. And then there are various love interests because obviously there's a situation that happens with Spike and Buffy. Um, and then there's what happens with Spike and Buffy. I don't remember. He sacrifices himself at the very end for her, and he is in love with her. Oh, okay. Because I know that he was a great character. Spike's was- story arc is probably one of the great, you know. Because Tragic. she hates us. Yeah, she hates herself for being with him, and he's in love with her, and she can't. She doesn't tell anyone because she comes back from the dead. They bring her back from the dead. Oh, that's And she's right. changed. Right. As you, as you tend to be. As you would be if you were brought back from the dead. Um, what series, what season was that when she comes back from the, because it was her sister? Her that sister, brings her she back? sacrificed herself for her sister. Okay. How um, Hunger Games of her. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, Katniss, it's been done before. Get over it. <laughs> um, yeah, so she... Um, she is, I think that's, so Dawn and the Key. So we had series, um, series four. Did Dawn so come in? There's Willow, right? Oh, Willow, yeah. Alison and, Hannigan. And, and her, and her the, the boy that she's in love with, who's yeah. like Skippy from, uh, he's like the neighbor <laughs> kid from that, from that TV show. Um, this is like Xander. Watching, that was this his is like watching TV with my mom. <laughs> that guy oh, yeah. oh, very much so. It's uh, I was born like this. So I, when I was eight years old, I'm sitting around Skippy. going, it's like uh, uh, it's like Eddie Haskell is what I was saying when I was eight. And it's like the Beverly Hillbillies. It's like their neighbor who's like Eddie Haskell. Uh-oh. And uh, anyway, so um, so there was there was uh, Nicholas Brendan who's Xander. Yes. Um, but then Willow, is he you going know, on to do anything? Um, Nicholas Brandon, that you know his name is amazing. Um, uh, not as much. He's actually a twin, interestingly. Um, but oh, Alison weird. Hannigan obviously has gone on to have a pretty big career because she's in How I Met Your Mother and she's she was in the American Pie movies and stuff. That sh- did she play Willow? She played Willow. She is the talking head host on the uh, Penn & Teller Fool Us TV show. Oh, right. Yes. Right. So she loves magic, it turns out, and has a gig where she gets to introduce people and be part of Magic X. Oh, that's great. So she that's, enjoys that. That's fitting. Mm-hmm. So she she's actually married to Alexis Denisoff, who was in Angel the t- this, and Buffy for a little while. He came in as a replacement watcher for... For oh, Giles, who was right, Buffy's right. watcher. Oh, that's right. Giles, who, whatever happened to Giles? Well, he was in a Maxwell House coffee ad in the UK. <laughs> that was the most famous thing he'd done there. Um, whatever happened to his character, though? Because I remember, didn't they get recalled or something? Um, he, well, he he leaves. He leaves her just when she needs him the most because he <laughs> thinks he's not necessary anymore. <laughs> I mean, this is where just brilliant characterization there's also Anya, the character Anya, who's played by Emma Caulfield, who when Buffy's mum dies in an episode, just does this explore because she's a demon that is newly human. Okay. She gets to experience all the human emotions for the first time and they're right at the front of everything. Yeah. So it's really just beautifully done. It's such a gift of a character to be able to have, because she says, I don't understand what's happening. I was just here drinking fruit punch and I thought Joyce would like some fruit punch and she's yeah. not here anymore and she's never going to drink fruit punch again and then she's you know oh, like, right, right. and I don't understand it and how do you live this because it hurts so much and it's just like this 
beautiful, like really, you know. Yeah. And she's got funny lines where like someone talks about being anxious and she's like, why don't you just masturbate like the rest of us? You know, um, <laughs> so she's a great, you know, I, I, I did so much. I could probably do a whole episode on this and I know we want to talk about other things. So, um, no, that's all right. But, but it's an, but it's an, it was an absolute gift uh, to see this complex layered character going through all of these teenage uh, emotions and growing and learning, but also still having to be the hero the whole time. Right. So, but yes, because Buffy kind of had to be both the adult and the child. And yes. it was, but it was such an ensemble cast. I mean, he's really good at ensemble casts, yes. Joss Whedon. And um, so there was the dark haired woman who was the cheerleader, who was kind of bitchy. Charisma and- Carpenter. Yeah, yeah. She played Cordelia. <laughs> Cordelia. She went on to be an angel and she had a really interesting story arc in that because she was kind of initially brought in as kind of like the airheaded vacuous one. Right. But who then falls in love with the geeky guy. Oh, right. She falls in love with Xander. Xander yeah. That's yeah. right. And then Xander and Willow have a thing, but Willow's actually a lesbian and then she has a relationship with Tara. And then and becomes then- a witch. Becomes a witch and then turns bad. It like evil Willow, pretty, pretty brilliant. Yeah, she flays someone in an episode, which is pretty hardcore for. That does feel for high school or yes. hot college. Was that the college years too? When that she... was college years. <laughs> and actually, that's the thing that they call the um, uh, fridged women. There's a trope within uh, comic book culture, which I just learned about yesterday, called fridging, which is. Um, like these women that only exist so that men can go on a hero's journey. Yep. So the woman they love is murdered or killed and it's called fridging because the Green Lantern comes back to find his girlfriend in pieces in a fridge. <laughs> right? <laughs> what a weird, deep, long box cut. Uh, yeah. Uh, holy crap. Uh, yeah. So Hal Jordan comes back and his girlfriend or wife is in a fridge. Yeah, a fridge, yeah. And so now he has to go on like a Taken kind of yes. Uh, revenge. Yes, yes. All right. Didn't John Wick someone kill his dog recently? And uh, so. yeah, so this this so but but this is the journey that men always get, and for women, it's when their kids die, they go and explore doing things. Right. So <laughs> we're gonna get you back. We're gonna get you back. So, but in this case, Willow's Tara is killed. Oh right. So this is Willow getting to do that journey. So that's even then he's kind of subverting right. that we're getting to see a woman do a uh, you know this kind of my my yeah. lover was killed. I'm going to do that revenge plot line and I'm going to flay someone. Like right. she literally takes the skin. It's quite a shocking moment for what that show is. Yeah, because there usually isn't much gore. I didn't see that no. episode where they, do they no. show some of it? Or? Oh, they show it. She just flicks yeah. like at him and his skin comes off. Oh, Christ. So it's, but it, but it's quite graphic. You're like, whoa, like hardcore Willow. Because you think when you first start magics. watching, yeah, when you first watch Buffy, you're like, oh, good, there's no bodies, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> they yeah. all turn into dust and they blow away. Yes. So, but when you, um, when something like that flank shows up or when the monster is particularly, remember that guy who lived underground, he, he was under the earth and wanted to yes. come and take over the world? Yes. And he needed a portal or something? Yes. Yeah. And it was a little boy. Remember that one? Yes, yes. That was, I think, when they brought Nathan Fillion in as well. There was like an order of monks. Was Nathan Fillion in that? Yes. So okay. Jo- Joss has a team, you know, because then Nathan Fillion went on, obviously, to be the lead in Firefly. Right. Which was also a great TV series. An amazing and a great TV, film. In a great film, uh, Serenity. Yep. Those are, um, it's great. And then I liked uh, the woman who was the the pilot in Firefly? Yes. You know her name? Gina Torres. Nice work. <laughs> <laughs> you have got all these names in your brain box. Well played. Um, and she's married to uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Is she married to yeah. Lawrence Fishburne? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I saw her as a lawyer in some other uh, uh, hour-long drama. So I'm glad she's still working because she was amazing in Firefly. Oh, Firefly was such a good show again. And obviously the, that's the beauty of Just Whedon. He does know how to write these uh, brilliant women and make them complex and layered. And and that's why, yeah, again, that's why it was so groundbreaking and revolutionary at the time. Yeah, he's have- really good at ensemble cast and he's really good at writing women. He, I guess it was some sort of uh, a bit of a buzzkill because it turns out he's also human, and right. uh, and he likes the ladies, and uh, and so when uh, th- there's he's not great in a, right. in, a in a power right. situation. I guess he's acted incorrectly occasionally, and um, but much like Dan Harmon, 
I think, and maybe not, like I know he didn't apologize like Dan Harmon did, but I think he has, he can be taught, is from what I've heard of Joss Whedon, is that he was like, that wasn't, you're like, yeah, that wasn't great, dum-dum. Anyway. I think sometimes with the slightly, and this might be me speaking out of turn, I think sometimes with the slightly nerdy guys, this goes across stand-up comedy or whether it's producers, writers, directors, they start as being these outsiders and then they are embraced and they don't realize they have power. In the same way, right? Right. They Where still think they're the underdog. They still think they're the underdog and they sort of become monsters and they don't realize that they, they're like, oh, no, no, no. Like, there's no way you would do this just because I asked. She right. must have been into it because I'm a piece of shit and everyone thinks that and I don't have any power. Right. And it's... it's That's a, not excusing it, by the way, please. Right, no at one all. listening. But at, this is nuance. These are exactly the kind of conversations that need to be happening, right? Right. Because, and, and there's a learning curve to it. You have a, you have a stand-up comic in your your um in in your country uh who has always thought of himself as the underdog and for a while was not the underdog had to relearn uh how to do stand-up i think uh because it was a bad couple of years with Stuart lee right where Stuart lee was the underdog and he was a yes. piece of shit and nobody gave a shit and so he said whatever he wanted and it was great and then he got a tv show and he became more powerful and then you're like dude you, you're not the underdog You are anymore. no longer the underdog. Yeah. Uh, get it together. And yes. so I think it took a couple of years. The same we have uh, Doug Stanhope here. Yeah. And, um, but I think you're right about that is that, but it, it, they need someone in their lives or they need to have realization in their own lives where they, they have to come to the other side of it and realize, oh no, I'm management now. Uh, yes. I am the man. And yeah. so, and, and to use their powers for good. Because I think Joss Whedon has used his powers for good for the most part. Yes. You know, maybe not in individuals' lives, but that yes. is true of me as well. I've been a piece <laughs> of shit uh, to uh, occasional individuals <laughs> who would like me to stop that as well. <laughs> and uh, they are not wrong. Uh, so, <laughs> but... Do you have a favorite episode or um, a favorite arc? Yeah, I think, um, I think, yeah, because weirdly, because Buffy runs after Riley when he disappears. I do kind of like the, um, I do like, I, I kind of like the Hush episode. Um, oh, right, because you know, of how dark and weird it is. Yes, yes, but I, but also um, the, the, Buffy, the one where Buffy's uh, mum dies. Um, Just because it's, is it the mostly the powerful ones that really get you? Yeah. Um, I felt like it was handled so, because there's a silence. It's almost like bleach. The way it's shot, um, it's called the body because she just comes in and finds a body. Right. So she comes in going, mama, and then she's on the floor. <gasps> and then it's realizing that she's not alive. But it's kind of this kind of, it's almost like she's gone into shock and the shock is shown really well because all the sounds it's just this kind of muted pastoral it's kind of like <laughs> oh wow you know like kind of you can hear birds yeah and it's over bleach there's sunshine 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 but it's very quiet and there's no dialogue and she's trying to get her up and then then she phones an ambulance and then she literally walks off and throws up yep and comes back in and then you just hear the siren and them to it's 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 beautifully done. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of as much in part of like the cinematography and the like how the episode was directed to mm -hmm. really, because what you're putting on the page there, I think it was Jonathan Ames said this to me once. He was like, the problem with scripts is they're too much like blueprints, they're schematics, mm -hmm. which is why I like writing prose, right? So yeah. this feels like, you know, how how did this is in the hands of the director or this is in the hands of someone going, cause I don't know how you write this oh, right. to make that these kind of moments really sing because it's not in the, what Buffy has that is great is zippy dialogue between characters yeah. bouncing backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 it's, it's, really it's often funny. very quippy and quippy and, and so funny and 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 like that. So these... she meets she meets um, uh, Dracula for the first time. And he's like, I am Dracula. And she's like, <laughs> Get out! You know, like it's great. It has that. You know, I'm and, and Xander going. I'm tired of being everyone's butt monkey. There's like great bits of, but this is all in the all in in how it's kind of graded and edited and and, and shot. So so much of it and her performance in it is really really great. But um, so that's probably one of my favorite episodes, which is a bit grim. But yeah, the well, body. Yeah, it's so interesting because this is very much light, uh, light fare, 
right? Mm. Like it's not particularly well respected or it wasn't at the time. It was like vampires and, and high school kids and who cares and all these things. But I have been recently been thinking about how much power is in these lighter movies and these lighter books and things that are just sort of, they feel more casual. Like, you know, like when you look back on like the beginning of science fiction, uh, popularity back in the, um, where the heroes were, were a lot of the, the, you think it's a cowboy movie where it's just good and bad and black and white, except for that it's a, it's Heinlein or somebody, or it's, uh, Ursula Le Guin where there is nuance and there is, and in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, this is an opportunity to talk about like real pain and real like angst and, and real, uh, just shitty behavior in general and really shine a light on it because there's vampires. You're like, Oh, she's going to stab somebody. And, uh, but then you have actually learned something in the midst of it all. Right. It's like, it's like the best of the superhero movies. Yes. The best of uh, science fiction, the best of romance, romantic comedies, you know, and, and I've, I've said this a bunch of times on the dark force that there's always like in these lighter books and stuff, and, and movies, there's always a B-plot. There's always some sort of weird message. Yes. And whether it's right wing or left wing, it is, it's there. It's yeah. so fucking there. And um, like I, I've been watching on a pretty steady rewatch, like a tiny child watching Aladdin, uh, the movie Long Shot. And it is Charlize Theron and uh, Seth Rogen. And it is a romantic comedy. And it's not realistic. And... <laughs> I have said this out loud before. I was mad about it because I thought that Seth Rogen has sort of purchased himself a trophy wife yes. of a movie. Yeah. Because what is Charlize Theron doing in this movie with <laughs> Seth Rogen where she's a love interest of Seth Rogen's? Yes. But it makes sense in the plot. And the and the script is hilarious. And there is a bunch of little zingers in it. You know, it has sort of this... Um, it's much more cynical than the American president, right? The American president had uh, Annette Bening and Michael Douglas, right? right? So, um, why would there why would there be someone at my door? Hang on a second. And we're back. Uh, <laughs> I just yelled at a guy for no reason. Yeah, then I had to apologize because that's how my life goes. <laughs> Hi, Tiffany. Stevenson. At least, at least you apologize, though. Uh, right, because right as I saw his eyes widen and go. What did I? I just rang the doorbell. I didn't do anything. I just rang the doorbell, and uh, yeah, it was Triple A guy. He was at the wrong house. It was one house over. My lovely neighbors. They're very nice. He seemed like a nice man. <laughs> Not the hero. Not the hero of this story, you guys. Uh, let's uh, let's keep going with Tiffany Stevenson. <laughs> what is the lesson we've learned there? What? Because uh, uh, what's, yeah, what's, I'm going to eat a cashew. <laughs> yeah, the lesson we've learned there is that um, that you know when you're wrong and you can apologize immediately. And look how simple it was. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. To say sorry. <laughs> it was not that hard. He took it well, too. He was just like, yeah. You'll notice uh, he did not say, no, no, don't worry about it. He said, yeah, no, no, you're right. You're right to apologize because you were weird. And he was correct. Okay. So, <laughs> Buffy the Vamp. I, I mean, here's the thing. On your list of I've other people. lots of things. We can move on. We could because... Um, Comparably, like you have Maya Angelou, yeah, and Charles Dickens on here. Charles and Eve Babbitts. Speaking Who's of Eve authors. Babbitts? Eve Babbitts was like a Hollywood it girl, but then that's kind of to diminish her. She's a phenomenal writer. And the first time I came out to Los Angeles, um, a friend of mine brought me uh, a book called Eve's Hollywood. My friend Steve. And said, you've got to read this if you're going to do Hollywood. And it's about, it's, it's, at the beginning, she sort of thanks Joan Didion for doing, being disparaging about, being that New York writer who's then disparaging about LA so that she doesn't have to do that. Because oh, it's okay. more like a love letter to LA. Oh, that's neat. Eve Babbitt's work. It's really rich. It's really layered. It's so smart and ahead of its time on a lot of things on like, uh, politi- but she's a writer. Beauty, beauty privilege. Yeah, but she was beautiful. So she was like in the, her. I think her father played, uh, was a violinist for mm-hmm. a, a studio. Um, in oh, the a studio, studio violinist. Yeah, studio violinist. Oh, wow. 
and um, that's thankless steady work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and her her parents. Um, so she sort of grew up in Hollywood. And she is the person to, but she was kind of an it girl for that phase and then was doing photography, uh, uh, photographing rock stars at one point. And this is just memoirs of her hazy kind of smoke and drinking years hanging out at the Chateau Marmont. And it is the 70s or? 70s, yeah, 70s. Um, 60s and 70s or 70s and 80s? Ma- mainly 70s, I think. But okay. her school years were kind of like... Uh, uh, um, 50s and 60s and she talks about kind of pachucho culture which I didn't know a huge what amount about so that's like a, a Mexican kind of it was like a culture a fashion there was pachucho and pachucha okay and it's in terms of that they were influential with music it was really interesting because she says at the time everyone aped Mexican culture everyone wanted to be like the, the Mexicans including the black singers everyone wanted to sing like this one kind of famous Mexican singer at the time and we wanted to dress like that and they were huh. seen as the the cool people in culture and then I think one of the big singers got arrested for statutory rape okay and there's a but, but this is how she is on like racial politics she was like like because he was Mexican. She was like, that's not condoning. But she was like, also at the same time, he slept with underage girls, but so did. Mm-hmm. Why aren't they arresting, you know, the Rolling everyone Stones? Everyone else. Uh, everyone else. And she was like, because they were white. Yes. So uh, the uh, Pachuchos had, you know how like, um, uh, I guess like how everyone dresses in the mask, <coughs> you know, these big kind of, <coughs> it was like the big pants with the sort of spats and the slip back hair and a chain hanging down from yeah. the, you know, it was the original. That was the look? That was the look. And um, and she said there were two Mexican kids in her school who were like, they used to have a dance competition in the gym on a Friday. And she was like, they were by far and away the best dancers. Right. But they would never win because of the inherent <gasps> racism of the teachers and everything else. So there's, a, there's this kind of unpicking of Los Angeles culture at the time. And and sort of the the co opting of that culture, yes, and taking sort sort of like what we what we know happens, but it's mostly the most of the examples are usually with African American, yes, um, work, yeah. So she was like, but everyone you know wanted to be to be like them, and then it kind of moves through into she's got great stuff on beauty privilege and yeah. how people split, like how um, you know. Uh, who the type of people were the itinerant people that sort of showed up in Los Angeles looking to create a life versus the smart you know like the that that kind of idea that the smart ones went to New York and the beautiful ones went to Los Angeles right right, right? back in the yeah yeah and she talks about beauty privilege and how and these are conversations that are being had now but she's talking about it in the 70s it's so far ahead of its time um she had a great bit on on kind of like a friend of hers who just was like, everyone's just so nice to me and they want to help me all the time and it's because I'm a good person. And she was like, no, it's because you're beautiful. <laughs> it's because you're super fox. Hey, yeah. super fox. And you're young. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 she's like, but she's never jealous of it and it's not resentful. It's like kind of, she's able to step back and view it on almost like um, uh, like object, in an, a, a, yeah, in an objective fashion rather than obviously, you know, subjectively getting upset that this isn't her life. And, you know, she's someone who's beautiful as well. One of the famous photos of her is playing naked chess. Okay. With the chess grandmaster. And those were the, like a series of photos that came out in the 70s and 80s. So I just think if you're in Hollywood, reading Eve's Hollywood, you get a real sense of, you begin to feel Los Angeles in your skin. Ah. Uh. You begin to wear it. So she's talking about being in Cantor's Deli and, observing people having conversations and her descriptions of stuff, almost like Confederacy of Dunces, mm-hmm. um, almost like Ignatius, how he uses this kind of really, uh, a, a certain level of hyperbole to describe something that's quite mundane, that's very funny. Okay. Like, and that the first time she ever ate a fig, she was like, I thought a fig was an assault on the senses. Like the idea of it. Like, right. But like a, the idea of her being 10 years old and kind of going, this is like the worst thing that could ever happen to a human. Right. Just kind of reminds me of um, Ignatius when his mum tries to get into his room and his response is, never has one human being been so totally and utterly besieged. 
So I always really enjoy that kind of level of hyperbole in writing about the mundane, and, and she does that beautifully. And so she... I've never heard of her. Is she just, uh, is in the word just, of course, but is she just a writer? Is she, um, um <clears throat> well, she was the person who introduced, um, Salvador Dali to Frank Zappa. Okay. You know, she's that kind of, she's a, per, she was a, mo- like, she was a person who brought people together. Okay. So she was like sort of a, a social, a socialite, sort of a, but like, that undermines but, how funny and great her writing is. Does right, that make but sense? L- sort of LA royalty, but, but, uh, but also really, really good at it. Yes. And, and, and she's 76 now. Oh, she is still with us. Yes. But she kind of disappeared from life. Um, uh, public life. I think she had an accident or, uh, you Just know, a wipeout of some sort. Or? Well, it was a, I think she got burnt. Um, and she sort of disappeared from public life for a bit. Um, <clears throat> she used to make album covers. So she would do, you know, so she was an artist in that, um, she designed album covers for Linda Ronstadt, The Birds, Buffalo Springfield. Oh, wow. So she did so, the her most famous cover collage for the 1967 see, album, Buffalo know, Springfield again. Okay. I know someone like this is um, Diva Zappa was on this show. Right. And she is a photographer and she follows bands and she um, is also, her dorkdom was knitting. And my favorite thing that Diva Zappa said about knitting, because I said, well, knitting seems very... Um, like if you make a mistake, it, it's a it's a hard thing to undo and then redo. And she goes, "Oh no, I never redo. I always think that's what the hat wants." And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, does it?" And she goes, "Oh, I know, uh, but I'm not undoing it and redoing it. I'm just gonna." And she also liked to pick the hardest kind of um, yarn, like the most ethereal kind of like fluffy yarn of all of the hardest kind. Where she's like, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to use this and learn how to knit using this weird cotton candy of a of of a yarn, and so she brought some of her knitting and it was. But she grew up as sort of that kind of royalty as well. Yes. Where, um, you know, I'm I'm friends with Moon and the and Moon's been on the show too. But Moon's Moon's dorkdom is more <laughs> this sort of uh, like yoga spiritual stuff, right? That was. Um, Truly dorky, but uh, but not. It's it's hard to put. It's uh it's it's hard to get your hands on it. Right. And um, but there's so much. It's interesting when someone who is raised like that in this situation would write sort of a love letter to that town to to the place where they came from. Yes. So yeah. that's cool. Did so it the, just the, the one book or? Uh, oh no, she's there's a few. I've I've been given one of um. Uh, I've been given one of like of, of her short stories. I think she was published in Rolling Stone and The Village. Okay. She went to New York for a little while and really hated New York, She'd and but hated <laughs> yeah, but hated how much um, the LA was referred to as a cultural wasteland when she was actually like culture is built here and this is a beautiful place. Uh, um, real the thing of the people who hate Los Angeles are incorrect. Uh, I. Whenever I go anywhere and if somebody slams LA, I was like, you know, I could, I would never, uh, I choose to live here. Yes. And <laughs> here's the thing about Los Angeles that is one of the greatest things is that um, Karen Kilgariff, I think, said it best. She said, every every couple of months, the best looking people in their small town move to Los Angeles <laughs> to find out that they are not the best looking people in the world. And what I find is that every six or 10 months I'll meet a half a dozen to a dozen new brand new comedians who have just moved here. And four uh, like of Tiffany. them, like you're like <laughs> Tiffany Stevenson and four of them will be incredible. And then the right. phone rang. This is the most interrupted episode of the dork forest ever. It could be, it could be, um, Um, 
Yes, to find out. So four comedians will move to find out that they're not the best comedians. You know, a dozen comedians will, will move here. I'll, I'll see them. I'll meet every six or eight months a dozen new comedians. And four of them will be incredible. Right. And I will say to them, why have I never heard of you? You're, why aren't you famous? And then they will say back to me, well, you're pretty good. Why aren't you famous? You've been here the whole time. And they are correct as well. <laughs> but uh, but the, th- the thing is, is, there is a problem with some people who move here. There's two things that happen th- that make people mad about Los Angeles. They move here and they don't, they don't know, they don't realize that they have to start over. You know? Right. You... If you come here with a set of skills, you win, right? Mm. Because once you get an opportunity, then it's like someone else... You're ready for it. Yes. You're primed. Someone can get you a job. They cannot keep the job for you, right? Yeah. So in Los Angeles, if you're ready to be seen, if you ever get seen, you have an advantage. But so starting at the beginning of open mics and and just showing up and doing that kind of legwork feels... um, Beneath some people. They're like, I was a big deal in Mm. Indianapolis. (laughs) And you're like, yes, but you are no longer in Indianapolis. And so, and then the other thing that will sometimes make people mad is if they decide to go home. Right. You know, they've given it a shot and they go home and they get made fun of back in Minneapolis or in Chicago. Oh, you couldn't make it, huh? And you're like, hey, fuck you. Uh, did you try? Yeah. You didn't try. You yeah. stayed here and, uh, and and didn't even go out and see if anyone gave a damn. You know, because a big portion of the industry has always been here, right? Right. But, you know, and but the world we're living in now, you can do it from Chicago. You can do it because of the internet and, and have them, you can live there and, and still make a big deal here. So, yeah. You can hop between London and New York and LA, which is what I'm doing. That's it. But I get it. But there is a kind of thing of like building a career and then coming here and then kind of going, okay, no one knows. So I have to go out and do stuff and do shows and hop up. And I'm willing to jump through hoops, but I'm not willing to jump through all the hoops again. No, because... So that's the that's where you kind of draw your line. You go, there's a bit of hoop jumping, but there's also... I'm exhausted. Know, yeah. yeah. There's part of me, like when I, when I moved here, I think I was 30... Uh, 31 and I was like I can do this but I can't do all of it like you said yeah because I'm tired and yeah. um and hopefully the effort that I put in will result in something and I know there are a few people who fling themselves out here without anything else and just go I'm in Hollywood I want to do it and mm-hmm. it, it is I guess it's different you know I have a body of work so I like to think that that you stands bring for that itself. to the table yeah and mm-hmm. a, you know a TV career and stuff in the UK but also, you know, it's all relative as well. Right. You know, and but people can see your work here or hear you. Like I do the Bugle podcast. So people will come out for shows from hearing me on that out here. Yeah. So you can start to build your audience from your hometown. Mm-hmm. And London obviously being, you know, the place where there's so much comedy happening. Kind of similar to New York. LA is much more spread out. But yeah. it's a much more even-handed approach to the business for someone who's like me. I do stand-up, but I don't just do stand-up. I act and stuff. And I'm right. Write. Yeah. So Hollywood does feel like the place to be to do that. There's just not a huge amount of money in, <laughs> no. in stand-up. But, and I, but I love the fact that the Eve Babbitt's thing brings you to this to this town yes. with more of a sense of hope and more of a sense of, of inclusion and, and love instead of a... Because when I moved here, I was told that I had to choose to like it. It was the best advice I ever got. Right. Because uh, he said, if you choose, if you don't choose to like it, you will probably not like it because there are things not to like. Yes. And, uh, and I was like, oh, okay. And he said, and you're going to hang out with people that you don't like very much in any new place that you move for the first yes. year or so. And then eventually it'll take you three years and then you'll meet four people that you genuinely really like. And then you will build a community around that. Yes. And he has been, uh, I don't hang out with him anymore. What happened there? <laughs> <laughs> but I do think I, I do kind of try and go with my gut as well on people. Cause I, you'll meet a lot of, there's a, a fair amount of bullshit is in my, in this town. And that's what sure. she talks about in her, book as well there's a certain type of guy that will kind of come over and just assume that you have no agency or idea Mm. of what you're doing even though they've just seen you be funny on stage oh and and they kind of go i can help you listen i know what to do with your career (laughs) 
And then I find out that they've never got a single thing away or right, written think, a thing. You it, know, feels, like, it feels like that that uh, that negative talk where they're negging. just yeah, – Yeah, which is uh, – I hate all abbreviations. So – but I think – yeah, so that, that negging business, it just – they can, they can make you feel bad about themselves and somehow climb – uh, attach themselves to your to, to your yeah. qualities, right? Yes, yeah. And it doesn't. I mean, every time I get off stage and someone, I've never really noticed it before. I would just get a vague feeling, like I just did stand up in Paris, and Rich Hall uh-huh. was the headliner yes. of Snigglet's fame. Yes, and Rich, um, is, Rich does my show in London, like on a weekly. Oh, there you go. Yeah, he uh, was enormously dismissive of me. And so he was not particularly nice. It doesn't mean – it just meant he was having a day when he didn't feel like, you know. Ah. And it's fine. It's a but shame. It was a that's shame. A, that's, a sh- that's Yeah. What, but, but yeah. Go on, and sorry. so I just sort of – I was like, oh, well, I don't need to stay and watch his set then. Because I got off stage and I did well. And they asked me to do an encore. So uh, one imagines, which was weird, because there is no encores yes. really in the stand-up comedy in – Los Angeles or in the United States. Right. There's because I just did my closer. I don't know if you. Yeah. Anyway, and you hired me to yes. do the 35 the, minutes. So I get off stage and the, the the booker was like, can you go do an encore? Another 10. And I was like, is Rich not ready? And he was like, yeah. no, no, no. I think the audience liked you so much. They'd like to see more. Right. And so then I got up and I did 10 of, of something. And then, um, and it was fine, but he didn't, he was there for the set and he didn't say anything. You know, he didn't say good set. He didn't say, it's been nice to meet you. He, he, he was like, uh, essentially just, he looked dead in the eye and then he turned and walked away. So I was like, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to dinner. And, uh, that's that's how I dealt with that. Yeah. Well, no, because it is, it's what we know the rules, right? And there are rules that after a comic's been on, and they've done really well. Withholding your praise is such an odd thing to do. It, it's at the at it's the a, very be- the best case scenario. It's an odd thing to do. The worst case scenario, it's kind of mean. Yes. Yeah. And 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 like uh, purposeful. Purpose because yes. you because we do all know that even if it didn't go well, yes. if it went okay, you just go hey hey. You were up there. No, yeah. you don't say well, that. But, but I mean, you kind of go, mate, like, or you point out the bits you did like. Yes. And you say, wasn't it great when you did that bit and that? And you try and give someone some something positive to walk and if you away can't, with. But I'm, I'm upset. I'm, dis- I'm disappointed that Rich did that because... Because you know him. Because I know him. And also because when I do my room in London, he's there the whole night. So he watches everyone. He's there That's from neat. the beginning of the, you know... Um, which is and enormously supportive. Yes, but maybe was he pissed off that you got an encore and you weren't close? Like, I don't understand. Who knows? That he was going to go on later and he was like, oh, now they're going to be like worn out by the time I get on. Well, but also felt- none of that is, is your fault. No, no. So to yeah. kind of get to, to, to do that is like, you know, that's. Um, it was weird. But I will say that. Um, the whole the whole thing was weird because he was called in last minute because Will Durst had a, a stroke, right? And um, and I got a text message uh, from a couple of comics going, "Hey, you're in Paris. Will Durst had this mini stroke. Do you want a set?" And I was like, "Hey, hey, you fucking ghoul! How's Will Durst? Did yes. he live?" Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and they were like, "Yeah, he's fine." And I was like, "Yes, I want the set, <laughs> <laughs> but don't bury the lead." <laughs> yeah. Will Durst had a stroke. He's okay. He's okay. Yeah, we need that. I need that piece of information yeah, up front. Yeah, let's not make me into the monster <laughs> that, of course, wants to crawl on top of his body. And and I'm aware that also this is a business that is very much like I like that I'm already on a female comics thread, but I feel like that that people have this kind of sense of honor amongst thieves for want of a better phrase, you yeah. know, of like kind of comics supporting each other, being there for each other. Um, and also trying to make it better for everyone. I feel like people at the top have to be campaigning to make it better for people at the bottom yeah, because they're the only people that can affect the real change. Right. Cause nobody's listening to the yeah. people on the bottom. And, and if you're in the middle and you say something, there's some risk there. Yeah. But there's less risk than the people on the bottom. And, you know, pick your battles, I guess. But say yeah. something. Don't just fucking let it be horrible. 
Don't let it be horrible. Yeah. And that's... Um, I'm thinking of getting a tattoo. Anyway, <laughs> say something. <laughs> Don't let it be horrible. Don't let it be horrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, yeah, that's that's kind of... Ugh. Disappointed. <laughs> and disappointed. I know. But here's I'm frustrated the, for you. But. but here's the great thing is that there is so much sort of encouraging... Um, Things that encourage us, you know, yeah. like that, that book is encouraging you to like Los Angeles. So this is what it says. Here's a paragraph from it. Um, although I have no, oh, okay. The fifties, as everyone points out, was a peculiarly charmless time into which, <laughs> in which to be an adolescent, but no one ever felt more bliss than I accompanying an older girlfriend to unemployment or inventing lives for fractionally viewed careless young men in Jaguars. Though wow. I have no kids and Hollywood doesn't exist. I firmly believe, however, that it did exist. And like Rome, we are living amidst the fallen columns and clotheslined courtyards in the ruins of an empire of the self-enchanted, which was once briefly more devastating than Caesar's and still brings respectable families to a hot, windy intersection in August to sigh with unnoticed despondence. Well, here we are, Hollywood and Vine. Wow, that's an amazing... You know, this... There are things, you know, like you'll read somebody who's trying to write something. Yes. That is something that makes, it's beautifully written, right? Yeah. Like the prose is, is outstanding. The use of words is, is extravagant. And uh, the imagery is big. But it is also, it makes sense. Yes. There's no hidden, weird, it's not cryptic, weird Instagram, the longest post in the world, where you're like, what the fuck is he saying? Yeah. And and it's not just big words for the sense of big words. Well, it, and it talks about, I think it's about her grandparents when they first arrived and they found themselves on the corner of Hollywood and Vine. So <laughs> in she's 1950? Kind of, yeah. Well, she was a teenager in 1950, so they would have been earlier than that. And, wow. Um, so it's just kind of this, uh, what the ideas of Hollywood are. And what are the real things that you can grab onto? And 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 she's fascinated by people. And I'm fascinated by people because I'm a storyteller at heart. Even in my stand-up, you know, I'm trying to tell stories. Yeah. When I'm writing, I'm trying to tell stories. And she's she finds people fascinating. And I, I have a little writerly exercise that I do before I ever read this book. And it feels to me like a thing that Eve Babbitts would do. Is sometimes I'll go out in my car and I'll drive through a neighborhood. Okay. Near me, but one that I don't know well. And then I'll go down the street and I'll pick a house and I go, who lives there? And I will make this series of assumptions or create a story out of what I see in the yard. Through the window? Through, well, yeah, but without being a creep. Right, you know, right, yeah. not being so you could crazy. See, you could see a wind chime hanging in the garden. Yeah. You take something from that. Do they have potted plants? Is there a pond? What kind of car are they driving? Yeah. And then you just create a world around the people that live in there. And I start to write a little story and it's like an imagined life of someone. Right. And I've actually got, I've got a new thing that I've done, which I want to do. I think Instagram's the place for it. I'm not sure. Um, but it's called the imagined lives of ladies. <laughs> and I have photographs that I brought in like a, it, w it would be like a garage sale in or New York. A state sale or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They were just, they're just pictures, but they're pictures of women and they're pretty much through like 20s and 30s up to the 80s. Right. And I want to take this picture and then create the story. Yeah, this is without this getting person. in your card. card. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I think an Instagram account with that would be real fun. And I just, I want to write the funny stories. Um, That's you know. cool. That's a great idea. I love the, I love, there's so much, Tiffany Stevenson, I, what I like about you is that there's so much hope <laughs> in like in, in your, there's, there's, like I get from you like this palpable intelligence and, but I also get this sense of just moving forward into something. We've got to do something and, yeah. and, and, and we have to stay sort of chipper about it, not chipper, but I mean like, like more positive, like don't wallow in yes. the things that are, you know, it doesn't deny that they're, they exist. Yeah. But stop hammering on the door. That's not going to open for you and just go around the fucker. Like <laughs> I honestly, like, I feel like because then part of part of me like feels like oh like I'm entering into some kind of madness because I'm coming over here at this point in my life you know and I'm right. not in my twenties but I also do feel like I have something to offer and then I've you know excitingly I've got some things away and stuff is happening you yeah. know and um, but but also I'm coming to this point of like having done stand up 
for um, a long time, having done Edinburgh's, having shows be like the best reviewed shows in Edinburgh. And I hate saying that because I do, my, but someone is, should. It's in my nature to be self deprecating, and <laughs> right. it's not Hollywood's nature. People yeah. aren't afraid to like shout their achievements, and they're not afraid to look desperate here, which is really interesting. But you know, uh, but but sometimes that also pays off like that kind of like I need I need I need mm -hmm. squeaky wheel thing mm -hmm. but what I'm realizing is that I I view it all as art so you know I, I believe stand-up is art and I n now I'm trying to be less judgmental when ideas come in that I go is that a piece of stand-up Right. Or is that something I want to put into a script okay or is this just a little fun adventure I want to go on here and right you know, because stand up is not the only filter for all of my ideas. And stand up's more the filter for my personal experiences of the world. And then sometimes I do bring characters in and stuff. Like yeah. I, I met a tour guide in New York a couple of years ago who was the basis for an entire show, my bombshell show. Because, really? Yes, because he had a group of about 20 people and this is word for word. I was with my friends and they were like, oh, that's gone straight in your iPhone notes. And I was like, of course it has. Because <laughs> this guy goes, over here we have pier number 37. This is where the Titanic was supposed to dock. We all know what happened here. Tragedy. <laughs> and then he went, anyway, moving on. Yeah. And I was like, what? That's... How is that talk? How I just a big, this guy stuck in my brain. It was like um a little like worm in my brain. Just a man saying tragedy moving on. Yes, because people fascinate me. Yeah, and I was trying to work out what he means in the greater scheme of things. Mm -hmm. And then it took me a while, but I got to, and this was the basis of the show. <laughs> but I got to, um, as so I like Eve Babbitt, I'm fascinated by people and watching people. Snatches of conversation fascinate me. Right, so. That was, I was like, oh, he represents all of us in this time of rolling news and terrorism and natural disasters and tragedy that we barely have time to acknowledge. Right. What's happened before we have to move on. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Tragedy. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> no more. To, isn't this horrible? Anyway, next thing. We've got, we've run out of toilet paper. Let's <laughs> move on. So, um, so yeah. So I think. I, um, I can't remember how I came off onto this, well, but yes, I'm trying because not the to... different uses for for yes. the stories and the things that come into your mind. Yes, yeah, and that and so that ended up being the basis of a show about how we receive how we receive bad news, how we receive uh, like yeah these events, and how ultimately we always try and make them about us because it's our ultimate way of understanding and processing. And I think stand up is a way of understanding and processing sure the world that we live in. Which is why everyone can do a joke about the same thing and every joke will be different. Yes. You know, just because uh, when it's well done, obviously. But I mean, like, but if you need to talk about airline food, you need to talk about it. Yes. And you make it your own and you you uh, you do whatever you got to do to make it interesting. So there's no such thing as hack topics, just a hack approach. Yes. A terrible hack approach. Very, very, it's, uh, it happens. And uh, and we all, and I've done it. I've d We've all been there. But it's so it's so interesting because I, I've done a couple of solo shows where I've taken that information from those solo shows and put it in my standup because the stories themselves are stories, but I tend to write funny stories. Yes. And they have some punchlines in them and then I can add more punchlines, uh, you know, and then it, we tighten it up and, uh, and we sell it as standup yes. and, uh, <laughs> and it's yeah. all good. Um, and I tend to, do more storytelling in stand-up anyway, which is... Yes, I've seen you. So I love the kind of the story element or the, that, um, I don't know if passing out's the correct word, but, but that, that kind of bit of it starting of being a, which is all great stand-up that I love and I hope I do as well, where it starts out as something that happens to you. But what does that mean in a to wider the, context for society right. and to everyone else? Right. Is uh, Maria Bamford has uh, yeah. this bit about how she wants to... Um, spice up her sex life with her husband but um some people like to to act out um different uh scenarios and the only scenarios she knows are uh sort of unfixable social issues <laughs> so she's like so the first one she does is gentrification right and so they're acting out gentrification <laughs> in a sexual <laughs> fantasy and you're like what is happening and uh so but she it's it's the big world made small. Made small. Or the smallest thing in the world made enormous. Yes. Right? So, um, 
yeah, it is. And and to get to get back to Buffy, that's yeah. what he does. He yes. takes something so absurd and big like vampires and and high school, and then making it very very personal. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It has been an hour, even though the interruptions have not been. Uh, there's been a lot of them. <laughs> I don't know. I usually unplug the phone. There's yeah. things that happen. Well, we talked about stand up a bit, and I hope that's okay for people listening because we we can be dorky about stand up, right? We can for sure. It's uh, um, it's usually organic uh, because I have a lot of stand ups on the show, and um, <laughs> and so at some point there will be a ten minute chunk about stand up comedy <laughs> as we meander around the stuff we're reading and the stuff we're watching on television. So Tiffany Stevenson, everybody. Um, if you are in uh, the UK and you want to see her there, uh, is there TiffanyStevenson.com? Yes, this is, yes, TiffStevenson.com. There we go. And it's at Tiff Stevenson uh, on Twitter and at yeah. Tiff Stevenson Comic on Instagram. Thank you so much for doing the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been real fun. And Rangers, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh my God. Thank we you. Why don't we just...